Chapter One of Jane Austen and Her Country House Comedy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Jane Austen and Her Country House Comedy by William Henry Helm. Chapter One Dominant Qualities jane austen's abiding freshness why she has not more readers characteristics of her work absence of passion balzac jane austen and charlotte bronte jane in her home circle her tranquil nature her unselfishness compared with dorothy osborne prudent heroines thoughtless admiration the year 1775, which deprived England of her American colonies, was generous to English art and literature. Had it only produced Walter Savage Landor, or even no better than James Smith of the rejected addresses, it would not have done badly. But these were its added bounties. Its greater gifts were Turner, Charles Lamb, and Jane Austen could we be offered the choice of repossessing the united states or losing the very memory of these three which alternative would we choose it is difficult to appreciate the lapse of time since jane austen was at work we are now within a few years of the centenary of her death she had been laid beneath that black slab in winchester cathedral before the first railway had been planned or the first telegraph wire stretched from town to town, or the first steamship steered across the Atlantic. Yet the must of age has not settled on her books. The lavender may lie between their pages, but it is still sweet, and there is many a successful novelist of our own times whose work is already far more out of date than hers. This perennial timeliness of atmosphere is no necessity of genius. Fielding and Scott remain a delight for succeeding generations because they possess the essential quality of humanity. But the life which they offer us is largely remote from our own, foreign to our experience. Jane Austen invites us to enjoy a change of air among people, with most of whom we may soon feel at ease finding nothing in their conversation that will disturb our equanimity. If you are one of Jane Austen's lovers, you come back to her novels for a holiday from the noise and whirl of modern fiction, as you would from a great city to the countryside or the coast village for rest and restoration. The failure of her books to attract the mass of novel readers is due in the first place to a lack of exciting qualities no syndicate that knew its business would offer them for serial purposes they have no breathless situations and their strong appeal is to the calmer feelings and the intellect not to the passions and the prejudices in one respect only has she anything in common with the popular novelists of our day her set of characters is even more limited than theirs the virtuous heroine the handsome hero, the frivolous coquette, the fascinating libertine, the worldly priest, are to be encountered in her pages, but the wicked nobleman and the criminal adventuress find no places there. What is often overlooked, however, by those who speak of Jane Austen's few characters is that no two of them have quite the same characteristics of mind. They are differentiated with admirable art. Even so, the types are few, and the smallness of the field which she cultivated has been frequently adduced as a bar to her inclusion among the masters of English fiction. She has the least range of them all. When one thinks of the host of strongly marked types in Scott, in Dickens, in Thackeray, of the diversity of scenes and incidents which fill the pages of their books, her few squires and parsons and unemployed officers with their wives and daughters who live out their days in georgian parlors and in shrubberies and parks 
make a poor enough show in the dramatic and spectacular way no particular passion dominates the life of any one of her leading personages avarice which has afforded such notable figures to almost every great novelist in her world is only represented by meanness lust and hate are nowhere strongly emphasized even love is rarely permitted to suggest the possibility of becoming violent there are no pecksniffs quilps paragrandets nor lord steins no lady Q's, jane eyres nor lisbeth fishers only into the hearts of her younger women does jane austen throw the searchlight of complete knowledge lit by her own feelings and tended with self-analysis and her heroines still leave a large part of virtuous womankind unrepresented balzac describing the origins of his play la marauder to the manager who produced it said we are not concerned with an appalling melodrama wherein the villain sets light to houses and massacres the inhabitants no i imagine a drawing-room comedy where all is calm tranquil pleasant the men play peacefully at the whist table by the light of wax candles under little green shades the women chat and laugh as they do their fancy needlework presently they all take tea together in a word everything shows the influence of regular habits and harmony but for all that beneath this placid surface the passions are at work the drama progresses until the moment when it bursts out like the flame of a conflagration that is what i want to show the scene described is jane austen's the quiet parlor the card players the women chatting and working with their colored silks the tea tray the shaded candles the general air of ease and tranquillity we find it at mansfield park with the bertrams at hartfield with the woodhouses and in spite of lydia and her mamma at longbourn with the bennets but the denouement to which balzac looked for his effect has no attraction for jane austen catherine morland at northanger abbey imagines some such tragedy smouldering into life below the surface of quiet habitude as balzac discovers in his horrid war of stepdaughter and stepmother and jane austen herself laughs with henry tilney at this impressionable country maiden whom he mocks while he admires balzac and jane austen both strove to depict life to show the motives and instincts of men and women as the causes of action in his case of an energetic and passionate type wherein the primary instincts are freely exercised in her case of a simple orderly kind which allows but little scope for the display of violence or the elaboration of plots there are exceptions of course which for fear of the precise critic must at least be illustrated balzac has his quiet pierrot and rose cormans who suffer as patiently and far more poignantly than an eleanor dashwood or a fanny price jane austen has her dissolute willoughby's and disturbing henry crawford's and also her maria rushworth's and mrs clay's who throw their bonnets over the windmills with even less regard for their reputations than a beatrice de rochevide or a natalie de manerville when a lapse from virtue on the part of any one of her characters was on some rare occasion necessary to her plan jane austen did not allow any prudish reserve to stand in the way but it must be said no less unreservedly that she never introduced vice where her story could do quite as well without it and it is never the central motive of her novels it is then not alone for the narrowness of her field that her title to greatness has often been disputed many persons whose literary tastes are marked by understanding and catholicity refuse to acknowledge the genius of so peaceful a novelist because of the absence of passion and sentiment in jane austen's works the author of jane eyre would not recognize in her the great artist that scott and coleridge believed her to be the passions wrote miss brontë are perfectly unknown to her she rejects even a speaking acquaintance with that stormy sisterhood 
even to the feelings she vouchsafes no more than an occasional graceful but distant recognition too frequent converse with them would ruffle the smooth elegance of her progress the three novelists here brought into momentary association the creators of eugenie grandet emma and jane eyre represent three distinctive forces in fiction charlotte bronte disillusioned with the world of which she knew very little and angry at its follies and injustices sat alone and poured out her feelings in her books balzac hungry for fame wrote furiously all night by the light of a dip stimulating his fiery imagination with the strong coffee which was the irresponsible author of many of his most astonishing chapters jane austen taking her meals and her rest regularly sat at her little desk in the parlor where her mother and sister were sewing or writing letters and placidly turned her observations and reflections into manuscript her hazel eyes we may be certain never rolled in any kind of frenzy her brown curls were never disturbed by the spasmodic movements of nervous hands great artist as she was she had no greater share of the artistic temperament than many a popular novelist who turns out two or three serial stories at a time by the simple process of shuffling the situations changing the scenery and renaming the characters if she had been touched by the strong emotion of a charlotte bronte or the burning imagination of a balzac she might have produced work which would have set the world on fire instead of merely infusing keen happiness into responsive minds and compelling their love and admiration that is only to say that if she had been somebody else she would not have been herself it is peace not war that she carries to us even her irony is not of the sardonic kind and in her work the master spell is so daintily mingled that the bitter ingredients seem to have disappeared in the making respect and admiration and sympathy in a high degree have been given by millions of minds not always emotional to many authors but jane austen is loved as few have been the love is inspired by her works and she shares it with elizabeth bennett emma woodhouse and jane elliot milton in a line which is as clear in meaning as it is foggy in construction speaks of eve as the fairest of her daughters jane austen is regarded by the generality of her lovers as the most delightful of her own heroines and not merely as the woman who brought them into existence could we have loved her so much if we had lived with her at steventon rectory or at chawton cottage what was she at home i think we know much better from her own letters than from her brother henry's panegyric which in spite of its obvious sincerity of intention too nearly resembles the memorial inscriptions of his own period to be regarded with quite as much confidence as respect faultless herself he wrote as nearly as human nature can be she always sought in the faults of others something to excuse to forgive or forget always is a word which as captain corcoran discovered of its reverse can hardly ever be used without considerable reservations we know from her own pen that jane we call one unwedded queen elizabeth why should we not call another jane did not always show so much tenderness for the faults of others and when we remember the endless variety of human nature we cannot but regard this ascription of faultlessness by an affectionate brother as of little more evidential value than mrs dashwood's opinion in sense and sensibility of the faultlessness of marianne's lovers it is no disparagement to henry austen to say that his little memoir is more convincing as a record of his own character than of his sister's their nephew mr austen lee who wrote the fullest and most admirable account of jane austen was still in his teens when she died apart from these sparse reminiscences we know practically nothing about her except from her own novels and letters but from them 
we may learn almost as much of the mind of this delightful woman as any loving relation could have told us it may be possible for an author to write an artificial novel without betraying his own nature to any positive extent but such novels as jane austen's cannot so be produced it is possible to write letters which apart from the penmanship offer no evidences of character but a pair of devoted sisters however different their ability or their philosophy of life could not correspond during twenty years without displaying much of the workings of their minds some of jane's literary admirers think that she was lively and talkative others that she was prone to silence in company probably both views are correct it depended on the company among those who could appreciate her fun and her wit her harmless quips and quizzing she was full of vivacity among those who raised their eyebrows at her impromptu verses and missed the points of her piquant remarks on persons and incidents she was speedily content within the bounds of good manners to observe rather than to join in the comedy of conversation we need not unreservedly believe her brother's assurance that she never uttered either a hasty a silly or a severe expression but we may from all we know of her be fairly confident that she had a control over her tongue which few such gifted humorists have possessed as for her temper it was said in her family that cassandra had the merit of having her temper always under command but that jane had the happiness of a temper that never required to be commanded that her nature was not in any marked degree what is commonly called sympathetic we may see from many passages in her letters and her novels afford ample corroboration there was no avoidable hypocrisy about her in this at least she is the counterpart of elizabeth or anne do not be afraid of my encroaching on your privilege of universal goodwill. You need not. There are few people whom I really love, and still fewer of whom I think well. The more I see of the world, the more am I dissatisfied with it, and every day confirms my belief of the inconsistency of all human characters, and of the little dependence that can be placed on the appearance of either merit or sense in a letter from jane austen to cassandra there would have been nothing to surprise us in this passage which is actually taken from the remarks of elizabeth bennet to her sister on the subject of bingley's long silence after the netherfield ball if jane austen did not cry over misfortunes which did not affect her neither did she pretend to ignore the affectations and weaknesses even of her nearest relations can it be supposed for instance that she was in the least degree blinded to the shortcomings of a beloved mother of whom she could on various occasions write such news as that she continues hearty her appetite and nights are very good but she sometimes complains of an asthma a dropsy water in her chest and a liver disorder a daughter and sister and friend whose attention was so closely devoted however unobtrusively to the study of character in a narrow circle would in most cases be a little trying but when the observer was endowed with a keen sense of the absurd and an irony which however weak in caustic was strong in veracity it might be supposed that she would be an enfant terrible of that mature kind which in our own days is commoner than the nursery variety in her case the supposition would be ill-founded she was at once too well-bred and too kind-hearted to let her special powers of wounding take exercise on gentle hearts but falsehood of any sort was abhorrent to her and as a consequence she was inclined in communing with her sister to show herself a little intolerant even of those amiable pretenses of sorrow for common ailments and small troubles which are so soothing to weak humanity she rejected for example the idea of commiserating with any one on account of a cold or a headache unless there were feverish symptoms of the vacant chaff well meant for grain of which tennyson sings so sadly jane brought little to market 
she would express to cassandra her sympathy with their acquaintances under great disasters and trivial misfortunes with the same penful of ink what she wrote to her sister of her devotion for whom from earliest childhood her mother said if cassandra was going to have her head cut off jane would insist on sharing her fate is far more free than what she uttered in the family circle few have realized better the value of the unspoken word or given their relations less opportunity to remind them of the evils of indiscretion if she was unemotional and in the ordinary sense of the word unsympathetic she is not to be blamed for this lack of the qualities with one of which she so amply endowed marion and with the other eleanor dashwood we can no more make ourselves emotional or sympathetic than we can make ourselves fair or dark or rather we can only alter our ways as we can alter our complexions by artifice the outward show of sympathy which is not felt is one of the commonest of hypocrisies perhaps inevitable at times from very charity happily it is not a necessary part of that ultimate barrier which even in the truest friendships and the deepest love makes it as impossible for one human being to see the whole of another's heart as it is impossible to see more than a little of the other side of the moon we cannot help being more or less unfeeling but we can subdue our selfishness in action almost everything that can be learned about jane austen strengthens the conviction that she was of the least selfish of women in her last illness the fidelity of her spirit is constantly shown and her affection becomes more unreserved in its utterance there is one letter wherein after speaking of cassandra she says in a phrase curiously suggestive of thackeray as to what i owe her and the anxious affection of all my beloved family on this occasion i can only cry over it and pray god to bless them more and more that she was by nature meek and lowly as one of her american adorers declares i cannot believe but if she preferred the spacious rooms and well-spread board of her brother's mansion to the common parlor and boiled mutton and turnips of her father's rectory she did not grizzle over her state nor did she allow her conscious superiority of intelligence to claim distinction in her home one of the few glimpses apart from her own writings that we have of her in her family relations is when in the closing year of her life her illness had begun to weaken her body she was obliged to lie down frequently during the day there was only one sofa at chawton cottage and although mrs austin in spite of the many ailments she had formerly complained of was a tolerably healthy old lady the stricken daughter made herself a couch by putting several chairs together and declared that she preferred it to the sofa which her mother commonly occupied sofas we must remember were at least as rare then as oak panelled walls are now it was in those days that cobbett regretted that the sofa had ever been introduced into his country and he no doubt according to his habit held the prime minister responsible for the aid to effeminate indulgence of which his contemporary cowper sang jane's discontent with the comparative poverty of her surroundings was not translated into ill temper there are many reasons for believing and few indeed for doubting that she tried to do her duty in that state of life to which she was born and from which she was not destined to emerge into the more varied pleasures and pains of a larger world what if among those whom she trusted she could not resist expressing the lively thoughts suggested to her acute wit by the acts or utterances of her friends she was the pride of her family and its sunshine even if her rays were more akin to the sun as we know him on a fine spring day at home than as we seek him on the cote de jour she seems to have been more nearly understood among the clergy and squires and other members of her family than most humorists in their immediate circles the common experience of the genius in childhood and youth if biographers are to be credited 
is for the delicate shoots of his intelligence to be nipped by domestic frosts but if there had been any freezing in the austin family it was more likely to be produced by the chill of jane's own satirical remarks than by any harm that the convention and narrowness of others could do to a mind so well defended as hers there are few traces of any such wintry weather having occurred at steventon or chawton jane was certainly beloved greatly and deservedly in her home she was no doubt a little lonely as genius one may suppose must always be and as those who are blessed or cursed with a strong sense of the absurd must be whether they be geniuses or not her sister was her closest friend but jane's published letters to cassandra read in the light of the novels suggest a reserve in discussing her inmost thoughts with that devoted spirit which seems hardly compatible with the closest concordance of ideas in spite of the completest concordance of affection and a high respect on jane's part for cassandra's sound sense and critical judgment very different is the tone of the letters of that other pretty humorist dorothy osborne to william temple in dorothy's case there was a perfect confidence in the entire sympathy and comprehension of the recipient this factor apart how much there is in common between the two dear women the one was dead more than eighty years before the other was born but in all the history of womanhood is there any pair in which the smiling philosophy that is the salt of the mind is more fairly divided jane austen lives still in elizabeth bennet and in emma woodhouse dorothy osborne only in her sweet self the one had no passion but her work and it was a quiet unconsuming passion the other had no passion but her love and it was never able to overmaster her intelligence in earnest she wrote i am no more concerned whether people think me handsome or ill-favoured whether they think i have wit or that i have none than i am whether they think my name elizabeth or dorothy it was not quite true in her case nor would it have been in jane's but it contains no more exaggeration than is allowed to any woman of sense and it was as true of the one as of the other love has lately been defined by a ruthless analyzer of feelings as a specific emotion exclusive in selection more or less permanent in duration and due to a mental fermentation in itself caused by a law of attraction jane austen had never read such an explanation of love as this yet her views on the most powerful of the mixings of animal and spiritual instincts are usually more placid than would please the fancies of maidens who sleep with bits of wedding cake beneath their pillows that passionate love is woman's whole existence is not exemplified by jane's favorite heroines emma or elizabeth did not so regard it even if anne elliot did lose some of her good looks and catherine morland her appetite when their hopes of particular bridegrooms seemed likely to be disappointed elizabeth would not have worried greatly over darcy if he had not come back for her and emma would have been as happy at hartfield without a husband as she had always been so long as knightley was friendly we cannot imagine that jane austen could ever have written to any man as dorothy osborne wrote to temple of a love which she could not make her family understand for my life i cannot beat into their heads a passion that must be subject to no decay an even perfect kindness that must last perpetually without the least intermission they laugh to hear me say that one unkind word would destroy all the satisfaction of my life and that i should expect our kindness should increase every day if it were possible but never lessen the conjugal instinct was not strongly developed in jane and although she seems to have been very fond of children and especially of her nephews and nieces it may be assumed with some confidence that the maternal instinct also found little place in her nature marianne dashwood emotional fastidiously truthful she left to her elder sister 
the whole task of telling lies when politeness required it romantically fond of scenery and poetry as any of mrs radcliffe's heroines stands out among the girls of jane's imagining as the only one who outwardly exhibits the conventional signs of passionate affection for a lover catherine's and fanny's emotions being more suggestive of maiden fancies of the flimsy furniture of a country mrs brain than of the yearnings of a juliet or a roxanne nevertheless the idea that the austin people are cold-blooded is warmly opposed in an appreciative little essay published in america a few years ago by mr w l phelps let no one believe he writes that jane austen's men and women are deficient in passion because they behave with decency to those who have the power to see and interpret there is a depth of passion in her characters that far surpasses the emotional power displayed in many novels where the lovers seem to forget the meaning of such words as honor virtue and fidelity it may be that like richard feverell on a certain occasion the henrys and edwards the emmas and annes are too british to expose their emotions but lucy feverell one of the purest and truest women in fiction shows passion so that no special power to see and interpret is requisite on the reader's part and the same note is true of many of the charming heroines drawn by the masters of imagination at any rate jane allowed her heroines as much passion and sentiment as so far as we can discover she experienced herself the one known man who seems to have come near to being regarded as her accepted lover was thomas lefroy who lived to be chief justice of ireland you scold me so much she writes in her twenty-first year to cassandra in the nice long letter which i have this moment received from you that i am almost afraid to tell you how my irish friend and i behaved imagine to yourself everything most profligate and shocking in the way of dancing and sitting down together i can expose myself however only once more because he leaves the country soon after next friday on which day we are to have a dance at ash after all he is a very gentlemanlike good-looking pleasant young man i assure you but as to our having ever met except at the three last balls i cannot say much for he is so excessively laughed at about me at ash that he is ashamed of coming to steventon and ran away when we called on mrs lefroy a few days ago no coquettish reigning beauty was ever more easy as to the fate of her lovers or less likely to suffer at their hands than this hampshire maiden whose fine complexion hazel eyes and well-proportioned figure attracted so much admiration and whose sweet voice and lively conversation completed the conquest of those whom she cared to entertain tell mary she writes to her sister also in seventeen ninety six that i make over mr hartley and all his estate to her for her sole use and benefit in future and not only him but all my other admirers into the bargain wherever she can find them even the kiss which c powlett wanted to give me as i mean to confine myself in future to mr tom lefroy for whom i don't care sixpence this agreeable irishman to whom in later years we find references in the records of the edgeworth family was speedily to pass out of jane's young life very soon she has to write at length the day is come on which i am to flirt my last with tom lefroy and when you receive this it will be over my tears flow as i write at the melancholy idea william shute called here yesterday i wonder what he means by being so civil we need not picture her as stopping her writing while she wiped the tears from her streaming eyes we went by biffram's she says on another occasion and i contemplated with a melancholy pleasure the abode of him on whom i once fondly doted she never did dote on any man so far as can be discovered or reasonably surmised to any greater extent than her favorite emma may be said to have doted on frank churchill 
Emma's feelings about the man who was secretly engaged to Jane Fairfax at the time are thus analyzed by Jane Austen. Emma continued to entertain no doubt of her being in love. Her ideas only varied as to the how much. At first she thought it was a good deal, and afterwards but little. She had great pleasure in hearing Frank Churchill talked of, and for his sake greater pleasure than ever in seeing Mr. and Mrs. Weston. She was very often thinking of him, and quite impatient for a letter that she might know how he was, how were his spirits, how was his aunt, and what was the chance of his coming to Randall's again this spring. But on the other hand, she could not admit herself to being unhappy, nor, after the first morning, to be less disposed for employment than usual. I do not find myself making any use of the word sacrifice, said she. In not one of all my clever replies, my delicate negatives, is there any allusion to making a sacrifice. I do suspect that he is not really necessary to my happiness. So much the better. I certainly will not persuade myself to feel more than I do. I am quite enough in love. I should be sorry to be more." Save for Willoughby's burst of misplaced enthusiasm over Marianne, Frank Churchill's description of Jane Fairfax to Emma is the warmest bit of love-painting in the Austin comedy. She is a complete angel. Look at her. Is not she an angel in every gesture? Observe the turn of her throat. Observe her eyes as she is looking up at my father. You will be glad to hear, inclining his head and whispering seriously, that my uncle means to give her all my aunt's jewels. They are to be new set. I am resolved to have some in an ornament for the head. Will not it be beautiful in her dark hair? Such raptures as these are rarely permitted to the Austin lovers. In their affairs of the heart, as in the general conduct of their lives, plain living and quiet thinking reflect the simple habits of the people among whom Jane passed her own smoothly ordered life. To the simplicity of that life we owe one of her peculiar charms. If she had been the famous, sought-after, literary woman who is the necessary complement of a dinner party in a house of cultured luxury, and whose name is found in the index of every volume of contemporary reminiscences, she would not have been half so attractive to the type of mind that most enjoys her novels. Yet when all possible allowance has been made for her lightness of expression, her own predilections were certainly for the conditions of opulent leisure rather than of decent comfort, for the amenities of Mansfield Park and Pemberley rather than for those of Fullerton Rectory or the Dashwoods Cottage. People get so horridly poor and economical in this part of the world, she wrote from Steventon to her sister at Godmersham, that I have no patience with them. Kent is the only place for happiness. Everybody is rich there. This was written early in her life. In the year before she died, writing to her niece Fanny, she said, Single women have a dreadful propensity for being poor, which is one very strong argument in favor of matrimony. But I need not dwell on such arguments with you, pretty dear. Contempt for poverty is expressed by several characters in her work. Be honest and poor, by all means, says Mary Crawford to Edmund Bertram. But I shall not envy you. I do not much think I shall even respect you. I have a much greater respect for those that are honest and rich. Perhaps neither the real Jane nor the imaginary Mary is to be taken quite literally, but that Jane would have freely assented to a disbelief in the wisdom of marrying on a small income, however little she approved of Mary's too positive admiration for wealth, is certain from all that we know of her opinions on the essentials of happiness. Godmersham is in Kent, and it was in that spacious, well-provided house of her brother Edward, amid all the charms of parks and beechwoods, of home comforts and elegances, that marked the life of the large landowner in those days, that she usually found herself most contented. Then was the time when the squire was not driven to find an income 
by letting his manner to a company promoter to whom the difference between an oak and an elm is scarcely known and whose chief object in hiring a mansion in rural surroundings is to fill it with weekend parties who play bridge indoors on summer afternoons and leave the beauties of the gardens and the park to the peacocks and the deer with such a modern plutocrat jane would have had little in common but she would have had less with the modern socialist landed property stood for everything stable and dignified in her days and those critics of pride and prejudice who unkindly emphasized the fact that elizabeth bennet only decided to marry darcy after she had seen the glories of pemberley and its park and gardens while they implicitly libeled the girl were not so unfair to the general sentiment of her period sir walter scott by the way was one of those who regarded elizabeth bennet's change of feeling towards darcy as the result of her visit to the fine place in derbyshire surely such a view connotes a failure to appreciate the humour of the conversation on this point between jane bennet and her sister the elder girl asks the younger how long it is since she has felt any affection for darcy and elizabeth replies it has been coming on so gradually that i hardly know when it began but i believe i must date it from my first seeing his beautiful grounds at pemberley even jane bennet whose humour sense was not strongly developed asks her to give a serious answer this much may be admitted that the idea of marrying the curate never presented itself to any one of the maidens who brightened the novels of jane austen with their charms of mind and appearance eleanor dashwood seems to have regarded about six hundred pounds a year with sure prospect of increase as the minimum on which married life could hopefully be entered upon and i fancy jane would have agreed with her the majority of novel readers may still prefer the hero and heroine whose love will triumph over all obstacles of position and opposition of want of sympathy on the part of others or of sense on their own and there have actually been readers who thought lydia bennet more interesting than elizabeth the prudence of the heroines may to some small extent account for the failure of jane austen's work to captivate the great heart of the public in any case her fame is far from universal she has never been and never will be popular in the sense in which the men and women whose publishers cheerfully print first editions of a hundred thousand copies are popular her appeal in her own lifetime when her name was unknown was not to the general and it is only much less restricted now because of the enormous increase in the reading public actually it is immensely greater relatively its increase is evidently small one cannot as in the case of some authors describe her work as being enjoyed only by the cultured class and neglected because misapprehended by the rest true culture is always discriminating even in the presence of its divinities mr anthony hope said not long ago referring to literary snobbishness there are certain companies in which to suggest even with the utmost humility that certain parts of jane austen's novels are less entertaining than other parts is thought considerably worse than drawing invidious distinctions between various passages of holy writ with those who regard jane austen's work as equally excellent in every part no patience is possible the reader who finds it easy to get as much enjoyment from sense and sensibility or northanger abbey as from pride and prejudice or mansfield park must be blessed with a comfortable absence of discrimination those who see no degree of superiority in the presentation of the characters of elizabeth bennet and anne elliot as compared with eleanor dashwood and catherine morland might be expected to regard blanche amory and mrs jarley as the equals respectively of becky sharp and mrs gamp such uncritical admiration as mr anthony hope referred to is even more annoying than the tone in which i have heard a distinguished writer speak of jane austen as that woman the mildest of the contemptuous terms that napoleon applied to madame de stael 
the author who spoke of jane austen so slightingly admitted her power of presenting a bloodless and trivial society in a lifelike manner no such recognition of power is allowed to her by an american critic of today who says of her work it may be called art but it is a poor species of that old art which depended for its effect upon false similitudes it is hard to believe that the writer of this astonishing opinion had read many pages of the author he thus condemned to a place among the third rates end of chapter 1《Chapter Two of Jane Austen and Her Country House Comedy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas. Jane Austen and Her Country House Comedy by William Henry Helm. Chapter Two Equipment and Method. Literary Influences. Jane Austen's Defense of Novelists. The Old Essayists her favourite authors, some novels of her time, criticism of her niece's novel, sense of her own limitations, her method, humour, familiar names, some characteristics of style, suggested emendations, a new problem of authorship, a forbidding writer, commonplace and superficial, Thomas Love Peacock, sapient suggestions. I believe there is no constraint to be put upon real genius, nothing but inclination can set it to work was one of the many sensible if unoriginal observations of the monarch in whose reign jane austen was born and died but the inclination itself is usually started by external suggestions and it is a mere truism that most books are written because others have appeared before them macaulay declared that but for fanny burney's example jane austen would never have been a novelist some of her early attempts at a complete novel did indeed take the epistolary form which was common in the preceding age and was the method of her admired richardson who i think fired her ambition quite as much as miss burney it would also seem that miss radcliffe's wild romances had induced in jane the desire to do something that should please by the absence of every quality that had made them popular i doubt if there is any author of any period to whom the most famous remark of buffon could be more justly applied than to jane austen le style et la femme meme is a conviction which becomes more and more firm as one reads her novels and her letters and reflects over their relationship her simple life and her limited opportunities her genius being granted are a sufficient explanation of her work part of that life and a part more important in proportion to the rest than it would have been in the case of one who had lived less remote from the world of thought and action was the reading of favourite books clarissa sir charles grandison and pamela influenced her strongly but she avoided more than she took from them in the formation of her style miss burney she now and then laughs at a little as when after john thorpe has said to catherine who confesses she has never read camilla you had no loss i assure you it is the horridest nonsense you can imagine there is nothing in the world in it but an old man's playing at seesaw and learning latin upon my soul there is not jane austen adds that the justness of this critique was unfortunately lost on poor catherine but where she loved she laughed she appreciated her sister novelist's work very highly and she writes of a young woman whom she met at a neighbour's house there are two traits in her character which are pleasing namely she admires camilla and drinks no cream in her tea scott's poetry of course jane read and enjoyed three of his most popular novels waverley guy mannering and the antiquary appeared during her lifetime and their authorship like that of her own works was not avowed until after her death how wide open was the secret of their origin from the very first years before scott's acknowledgment we may see in one of jane's letters of eighteen fourteen where she says walter scott has no business to write novels especially good ones it is not fair he has fame and profit enough as a poet and should not be taking the bread out of the mouths of other people i do not like him and do not mean to like waverley if i can help it but i fear i must she herself declared half jestingly that she wrote for fame and not for profit neither in any but shallow measure was granted to her whilst she lived she did not like robert burns pant after distinction nor was she of the pushing type the offering up of self-respect in the cause of self-interest was the least possible of sacrifices with her 
The Machine-Made Horrors of Anne Radcliffe, La Reine de Epouvantement, as she has been aptly called, in spite of her retiring disposition, were as familiar to Jane as were those far less pouvantable of Ainsworth to the girls of a later generation. The Radcliffe novels were published between Jane's fourteenth and twenty-third years, when she was most open to romantic influences. But, however much she may have shuddered over them in her teens, she laughed at them in her twenties. And it is certainly to the desire to satirise the melodramatic sensations of the school of fiction which they represent that we chiefly owe Northanger Abbey, a pleasant mixture of a serious love story and a burlesque, a motto for which might have been found in a sonnet of Shakespeare, my mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. I grant I never saw a goddess go. My mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. It is in this novel that, leaving her characters for a page or two to take care of themselves, the author thus refers to the sorrows of the novel-making craft, and expresses her high appreciation of the work of Miss Burney and of Miss Edgeworth. Let us not desert one another, we are an injured body. Although our productions have afforded more extensive and unaffected pleasure than those of any other literary corporation in the world, no species of composition has been so much decried. From pride, ignorance, or fashion, our foes are almost as many as our readers. And while the abilities of the nine hundredth abridger of the history of England, or of the man who collects and publishes in a volume some dozen lines of Milton, Pope, and Prior, with a paper from the spectator and a chapter from Stern, are eulogised by a thousand pens, there seems almost a general wish of decrying the capacity and undervaluing the labour of the novelist, and of slighting the performances which have only genius, wit, and taste to recommend them. I am no novel reader. I seldom look into novels. Do not imagine that I often read novels. It is really very well for a novel. Such is the common cant. And what are you reading, miss? Oh, it is only a novel replies the young lady, while she lays down her book with affected indifference or momentary shame. It is only Cecilia, or Camilla, or Belinda, or, in short, only some work in which the greatest powers of the mind are displayed, in which the most thorough knowledge of human nature, the happiest delineation of its varieties, the liveliest effusions of wit and humour are conveyed to the world in the best chosen language. Now, had the same young lady been engaged with a volume of The Spectator, instead of such a work, how proudly would she have produced the book and told its name, though the chances must be against her being occupied by any part of that voluminous publication of which either the matter or manner would not disgust a young person of taste. The substance of its papers so often consisting in the statement of improbable circumstances, unnatural characters, and topics of conversation, which no longer concern any one living and their language, too, frequently so coarse as to give no very favourable idea of the age that could endure it. This is a hard saying for those who count Sir Roger de Coverley, Mr. Bickerstaff, and many Clarindas and Sophronias among their friends. The age of the Regency may or may not have been as lax in its morality as some of its detractors have declared, but that it was one in which ladies could reasonably have been expected to blush over the pages of the spectator is not easily to be believed. The girls in the manor-houses and parsonages of those days formed their literary tastes on native productions without going abroad for their novels. They did not read French fiction as their grandmothers and great-grandmothers had done, or as their cousins in town still did, in spite of such warnings as that of a contemporary critic who held it scarcely possible to read French without contracting some pollution, so extensively and radically is its whole literature depraved. Times had changed since Dorothy Osborne discussed the voluminous romances of Calprened and Mademoiselle de Scudery with William Temple. Another important branch of Jane's private and voluntary curriculum was her reading not only of the coarse journalism of Steele and Addison and their colleagues, but in the various successes of The Spectator and The Tatler, which had their little days and died particularly during the reign of George the Second. Not only in the Rambler and the Idler of the great man whom she so highly respected, but in the World, the Mirror, the Lounger, the Connoisseur, and other less remembered publications of their class, you may come upon characters and reflections and incidents which may have afforded fruitful suggestions to one who, after the manner of genius, could turn even the dullness of others into sparkling delight of her own. 
Her favourite poet was Crabbe. She never met him, but she was so charmed by his work that, as her nephew has recorded, she used jokingly to say, if she ever married at all, she could fancy being Mrs. Crabbe. Her appreciation of such poems as The Village and The Parish Register is suggestive. She herself made no attempt to illustrate the simple annals of the poor. Born in a family which was itself a part of the landed gentry, in those days, in its pride, she was obviously conscious of a lofty barrier between her own class and the peasantry. George Crabbe, on the other hand, the son of lowly folk, was born and nurtured in poverty, and he never forgot that he had sprung from the sand dunes of the east coast. His pictures of the poor, their sorrows and joys, fill the most delightful of his verses. His ease in their society, his understanding of their minds and characters, mark him off as clearly from Jane Austen as to take a very modern instance, the admirable and sympathetic pictures of farm life offered in La Terre qui meurt distinguish Monsieur René Bazin from Monsieur Marcel Batalia, who has dealt so feelingly with the decadence of the chateau in La Vendée aux Genet. Jane found in Crabbe something that she missed in herself, a ready appreciation of all classes. She loved Cooper, too, both in his poems and his prose. There was much in The Task that could not but please her, though the humour must have struck her as being exceedingly mild, and the descriptions over-laboured. Cooper, though kindly to the rural poor, and often referring to their occupations, smiles derisively at those who pretend to envy the labourer's lot, and to regard his cottage, if properly rose-bordered, as preferable to any other kind of residence. So farewell, envy of the peasant's nest, if solitude can make scant the means of life, society for me, thou seeming sweet, be still a pleasing object in my view, my visit still, but never mine abode. Jane was wholly in accord with the sentiment of these lines. In some verses, composed in 1807 for a family competition in producing rhymes with Rose, which, but for the rhyming, are a burlesque of Cooper's style, we find a picture of a cottager, wherein, if the poetry be naturally of small account, are lines that would mark it, without the direct evidence of the name, as hers, and not Cassandra's or Mrs. Austen's. Happy the labourer in his Sunday clothes, in light drab coat, smart waistcoat, well darned hose, and hat upon his head, to church he goes. As oft with conscious pride he downward throws a glance upon the ample cabbage rose, which stuck in his buttonhole regales his nose, he envies not the gayest London bows, in church he takes his seat among the rows, pays to the place the reverence he owes, likes best the prayers whose meaning least he knows, lists to the sermon in a softening doze, and rouses joyous at the welcome close. There is a letter of January 1758 from Johnson to Bennett Langton, which, as Boswell remarks, shows its writer in as easy and pleasant a state of existence as constitutional unhappiness ever permitted him to enjoy. I cannot help quoting it here as evidence of an affinity of Johnson in his happiest hours with his constitutionally cheerful admirer, Jane Austen. The two Whartons just looked into the town, and were taken to see Cleone, where David says they were starved for want of company to keep them warm. David and Doddy have had a new quarrel, and, I think, cannot conveniently quarrel any more. Cleone was well acted by all the characters, but Bellamy left nothing to be desired. I went the first night, and supported it as well I might, for Doddy, you know, is my patron, and I would not desert him. The play was very well received. Doddy, after the danger was over, went every night to the stage-side, and cried at the distress of poor Cleone. I have left off housekeeping, and therefore made presents of the game which you were pleased to send me. The pheasant I gave to Mr. Richardson, the bustard to Dr. Lawrence, and the pot I placed with Miss Williams, to be eaten by myself. Mr. Reynolds has within these few days raised his price to twenty guineas a head, and Miss is much employed in miniatures. I know not anybody else whose prosperity has increased since you left them. If the date and the reference to the writer's relations with the dramatist had been suppressed, the letter might have been given as one of Jane's own without arousing suspicion in any but a confirmed Boswellian. David is Garrick, of course, while Doddy is Dodsley, author of the play, and the fortunate recipient of the Langton pheasant is the author of Clarissa, another of Jane's favourites more than thirty years after, when she had had time to be born and grow up. Richardson, Fanny Burney, Anne Radcliffe, Maria Edgeworth, after 1800, Scott as poet, 
Johnson, Crabb, and Cooper, then, afforded the more solid literary nourishment of Jane Austen. She had studied the essayists of Queen Anne's time and their emulators, and was not unfamiliar with fielding, and she did not neglect the ordinary books that came from the circulating libraries of the day. Mrs. Martin, she writes of a bookseller in her neighbourhood who had started such a library, as an inducement to subscribe tells me that her collection is not to consist only of novels but of every kind of literature etc she might have spared this pretension to our family who are great novel readers and not ashamed of being so but it was necessary i suppose to the self-consequence of half of her subscribers unhappily this high-class venture was a total failure the novels supplied by mrs martin and others forerunners of those which now go forth from the strand and oxford street are frequently referred to in jane's letters and some of them if we are so disposed we can read at the british museum there was for example sarah burney's clarentine which jane and her mother read for the third time in eighteen o seven and are surprised to find how foolish it is full of unnatural conduct and forced difficulties there was self-control a book without anything of nature or probability but which jane feared might be too clever and that she might find her own work forestalled by it there was the alphonsine of madame de genlis which did not do we were disgusted in twenty pages as independent of a bad translation it has indelicacies which disgrace a pen hitherto so pure and there was margiana which the austens were reading in the winter of eighteen o nine at southampton and like very well indeed we are just going to set off for Northumberland, to be shut up in Widrington Tower, where there must be two or three sets of victims already immured under a very fine villain. About the same time, Cassandra tells of some romance which the Godmersham Circle had been devouring, and Jane replies, To set up against your new novel, of which nobody ever heard before, and perhaps never may again, we have got Ida of Athens, by Miss Owenson, which must be very clever, because it was written, as the authoress says, in three months we have only read the preface yet but her irish girl does not make me expect much if the warmth of her language could affect the body it might be worth reading in this weather we shall not find much criticism of books either in the novels or the letters there is a passage in one of aunt jane's letters to her niece anna written in eighteen fourteen in which her point of view on one important question of style is clearly expressed anna probably inspired by her aunt's example for the authorship of Sense and Sensibility and Pride and Prejudice had leaked out in the family, in spite of all precaution, had written a novel herself, and had sent the manuscript to Jane for kindly consideration and advice. The result was not wholly encouraging. Your Aunt Cassandra does not like desultory novels, and is rather afraid yours will be too much so, that there will be too frequently a change from one set of people to another, and that circumstances will be introduced of apparent consequence which will lead to nothing it will not be so great an objection to me if it does i allow much more latitude than she does and think nature and spirit cover many sins of a wandering story and people in general do not care so much about it for your comfort i have scratched out the introduction between lord portman and his brother and mr griffin a country surgeon don't tell mr c lyford would not be introduced to men of their rank and when mr p is first brought in he would not be introduced as the honourable that distinction is never mentioned at such times at least i believe not of a later novel of anna's which jane read to your aunt cassandra in our own room at night while we undressed she tells the girl that devereux forester's being ruined by his vanity is extremely good but i wish you would not let him plunge into a vortex of dissipation i do not object to the thing but i cannot bear the expression it is such thorough novel slang and so old that i dare say adam met with it in the first novel he opened mrs austen had said and jane agreed with her that anna had allowed a married couple in the novel to be too long in returning a visit from the vicar's wife and jane had ventured to expunge as too familiar and inelegant the bless my heart in which sir thomas one of the characters indulged jane's own emma might say good god when she pleased but anna's sir thomas might not even bless his heart a last criticism on anna's book is worth quoting for its direct bearing on the critic's own method you describe a sweet place but your descriptions are often more minute than will be liked you give too many particulars of right hand and left jane's estimate of her own manner of work is modest enough the little bit two inches wide of ivory on which i work with so fine a brush as produces little effect after much labour she says 
with this phrase of her own as a text she has been called a miniaturist but if artists and authors are to be compared there is quite as much of the selection and the richness of a gainsborough in her work as of the minuteness of a metsu or a maisonnier in her reply to the amazing proposal of the librarian at carlton house that she should compose an historical romance founded on the records of the saxe coburg family she writes not without a touch of her gentle satire i am fully sensible that such a romance might be much more to the purpose of profit or popularity than such pictures of domestic life in country villages as i deal in but i could no more write a romance than an epic poem i could not sit seriously down to write a serious romance under any other motive than to save my life and if it were indispensable for me to keep it up and never relax into laughing at myself or any other people i am sure i should be hung before i had finished the first chapter no i must keep to my own style and go on in my own way and though i may never succeed again in that i am convinced that i should totally fail in any other her limitations of subject are clear in her own mind even of the domestic life in villages she would only deal with the side where the daily bread was provided out of income not out of retail profits or weekly wages it is a suggestive fact to which i have already alluded that she never even tried to draw a peasant's family her heroines may on the rarest occasions call at a cottage to inquire after a sick child or leave a charitable gift but of the conditions under which the labouring classes lived during the hard times of the french wars we learn nothing at all from her writings the nearest approaches to such subjects are the account of the price's home at portsmouth a sordid interior which has been held i think not unjustly to be as vivid in its suggestion of impecuniosity and discomfort as anything written by zola and the similar but far less effective picture of the watson's family life her literary style seems to be spontaneous and so in comparison with that of stylists it certainly is she had stored her mind with good literature while still in her teens and no doubt most of her limpid sentences flowed freely from her pen but the consistent absence of superfluous epithets and other redundancies is evidence that she had consciously formed an ideal of composition and that she thought out the means of producing her effects is clear from several passages in her letters to her niece who addressed her as dear miss darcy and wanted her to answer in that character jane replied even had i more time i should not feel at all sure of the sort of letter that miss d would write she had studied her art till she could analyse its qualities as we may see from a letter written from chawton in eighteen thirteen mrs austen had been reading pride and prejudice aloud to jane and martha lloyd who lived with the austens and jane tells cassandra that though she perfectly understands the characters herself she cannot speak as they ought upon the whole however i am quite vain enough and well satisfied enough the work is rather too light and bright and sparkling it wants shade to be stretched out here and there an essay on writing a critique on walter scott or the history of bonaparte or something that would form a contrast and bring the reader with increased delight to the playfulness and epigrammatism of the general style happily she did not provide the conventional shade which would have been on a par with the brown tree that according to sir george beaumont was an indispensable feature of every properly composed landscape painting shade however did appear in several chapters of persuasion which for a certain suggestion of melancholy stands apart from the other novels though not as markedly as northanger abbey stands apart for its exuberant frivolity macaulay declared of fanny burney's later style that it was the worst that has ever been known among men jane austen's style in its happy hours is so admirably adapted to its purpose that while we may not call it the best a term which advertisement has rendered meaningless as a standard of excellence it has never been surpassed as a means to a desired end it seems trite to say that the first point to consider in any question of style is the intended result but it is a point so frequently overlooked that much criticism about art and letters as about politics or agriculture is vitiated by the hopeless effort to set up an abstract ideal applicable to all cases like a universal watch-key the result for which jane austen worked can scarcely be put in question she was impelled to make her little world live in fiction not precisely as she saw it and heard it but as she could most attractively present it to minds possessing the indispensable modicum of humour without which the charm is lost at least as nearly as the charm of a turner sunset by a person whose optic nerve is irresponsive to red rays apart from her prevailing humour the modesty of her style is a continual beauty 
there is none of that florid eloquence which depends more on sound than sense for its effect nor of that forcing of strange phrases which in these days so often passes for literary excellence there is no precociosity about her books the narrative is easy the incidents are probable the dialogue with few exceptions is natural the bright people being differentiated from the dull by their talk and not as in most novels by the author's assurances if mr meredith was right when he declared that it is unwholesome for men and women to see themselves as they are if they are no better than they should be there must be many unwholesome pages in jane austen's work for the tolerably large class to which he referred neither in real life nor in the life of her books did she suffer fools gladly and so far as the men of her creation are concerned she is on the whole more successful in representing the foolish than the wise her chief failure is in the realization of such a young man as one of her heroines would have been likely to admire most of the younger men are sketchily drawn and we who are men would fain believe that she did not understand the nature of a man's heart seeing that she never found one worth accepting knightley and bertram seem to have been favourites of hers but they are not lively people nor sufficiently wanting in priggishness the liveliest of them all is henry tilney whatever his qualities of mind the jane austen touch is charmingly varied and it is felt in some of its happy strokes in the talk between this mercurial young rector and the girl whose early budding affections he so speedily returns have you been long in bath madam about a week sir replied catherine trying not to laugh really with affected astonishment why should you be surprised sir why indeed said he in his natural tone but some emotion must appear to be raised by your reply and surprise is more easily assumed and not less reasonable than any other this bit of dialogue recalls a remark in a letter written by jane to cassandra benjamin portal is here how charming that is i do not exactly know why but the phrase followed so naturally that i could not help putting it down mr collins is one of the most finished of jane's studies of men he comes near to the impossible at times but she makes him a living creature the speech in which he offers his hand and advantages to his cousin elizabeth has often been quoted and its charms can never fade only a page of it is necessary to tempt the reader to turn again or for the first time to pride and prejudice in order that he may find the rest of the inimitable scene my reasons for marrying are first that i think it is a right thing for every clergyman in easy circumstances like myself to set the example of matrimony in his parish secondly that i am convinced it will add very greatly to my happiness and thirdly which perhaps i ought to have mentioned earlier that it is the particular advice and recommendation of the very noble lady whom i have the honour of calling patroness twice has she condescended to give me her opinion unasked too on this subject and it was but the very saturday night before i left hunsford between our pools at quadrille while mrs jenkinson was arranging mr berg's footstool that she said mr collins you must marry a clergyman like you must marry choose properly choose a gentlewoman for my sake and for your own let her be an active useful sort of person not brought up high but able to make a small income go a good way this is my advice find such a woman as soon as you can bring her to hunsford and i will visit her allow me by the way to observe my fair cousin that i do not reckon the notice and kindness of lady catherine de bourgh as among the least of advantages in my power to offer you will find her manners beyond anything i can describe and your wit and vivacity i think must be acceptable to her especially when tempered with the silence and respect which her rank will inevitably excite the immediate consequences of elizabeth's refusal are delightfully imagined and described the moment mrs bennet hears of it she rushes to her husband's room you must come and make lizzie marry mr collins for she vows she will not have him and if you do not make haste he will change his mind and not have her mr bennet raised his eyes from his book as she entered and fixed them on her face with a calm unconcern which was not in the least altered by her communication i have not the pleasure of understanding you said he when she had finished her speech of what are you talking of mr collins and lizzie lizzie declares that she will not have mr collins and mr collins begins to say that he will not have lizzie and what am i to do on the occasion it seems a hopeless business speak to lizzie about it yourself tell her that you insist upon her marrying him let her be called down 
she shall hear my opinion. Mrs. Bennet rang the bell, and Miss Elizabeth was summoned to the library. Come here, child, cried her father as she appeared. I have sent for you on an affair of importance. I understand that Mr. Collins has made you an offer of marriage. Is it true? Elizabeth replied that it was. Very well. And this offer of marriage you have refused? I have, sir. Very well. We now come to the point. Your mother insists upon your accepting it. Is it not so, Mrs. Bennet? Yes, or I will never see her again. An unhappy alternative is before you, Elizabeth. From this day you must be a stranger to one of your parents. Your mother will never see you again if you do not marry Mr. Collins, and I will never see you again if you do. There is nothing commonplace about this. What matter that the characters are only middle class and respectable if they can afford material for such excellent wit? In one respect, judged by the present standard in fiction, Jane Austen's work assuredly is commonplace. No novelist was ever less troubled in the search for names. She merely took those of people she had heard of or met, preferring the common to the unusual. Bennet, Dashwood, Elliot, Price, Woodhouse, names that the modern popular novelist would reject at sight, served her turn. A Darcy or a Tilney being her highest flights in nomenclature. As for the Christian names, they are of the most ordinary and are used over and over again. In Sense and Sensibility, for example, three of the prominent characters are named John, John Dashwood, John Middleton, and John Willoughby. There are two Catherines in Pride and Prejudice, Elizabeth's, Fanny's, Anne's, Mary's, Edward's, Henry's, Robert's, fill the bills, and such a name as Frank Churchill seems recondite. It is much the same in the letters, the truth being that the Gladyses and Evadnes and Marmadukes of those days were very rare and almost unknown in rural society. The burden which her sister Cassandra bore must have strengthened Jane's determination that her heroes and heroines should not have unusual names. And so we have our Eleanors and Elizabeths and Fannies with their Edwards and Edmunds and Henrys. The Darcys are almost the only exceptions that try the rule. Fitzwilliam and Georgiana are more in the style of the ordinary novel of high life. So much for names. How are the men and women who bear them introduced to us? When a Colonel Newcombe, or an Alfred Jingle, or a Sylvain Pons comes upon the scene, we hear a good deal about his personal appearance, his manner of dress, his bearing, and those who introduce him have a huge circle of men and women to bring before us with similar formalities. Jane Austen, like a casual hostess at a modern dance, leaves us, as often as not, to make acquaintance in any way we can. Scott, with his wealth of character studies among high and middle and low, his kings and cavaliers and covenanters and crofters, was the most generous giver of types among Jane Austen's contemporaries, Maria Edgeworth in depicting the gentry and peasantry of Ireland, and John Galt, the small shopkeepers and their customers in the Scottish country towns managed to present us to a large circle of new acquaintances of various classes and occupations. Jane had no use for characters or centres of social life that required to be specially described for a particular purpose. Only in one of her novels, Sense and Sensibility, is the busy life of London made the subject of any but the most casual description, and even then it is but the transference of the country people to town, and of the two or three townspeople back to their London houses from their country visits, that is affected. The general life of the metropolis, its theatres, parks, and bustles, are left, to all intent, unnoticed. Yet, as we know from many passages in her letters, Jane during her visits was a keen spectator of the pageantry of life in a city, which, she jestingly declared, played havoc with her character. Here I am once more in this scene of dissipation and vice, she writes from Cork Street in August 1796, and I begin already to find my morals corrupted and in the next month she sends this little message to Mr. Austen. My father will be so good as to fetch home his prodigal daughter from town, I hope, unless he wishes me to walk the hospitals or enter at the temple or mount guard at St. James's. She was not prodigal, save in gloves and ribbons, but she enjoyed the delights of the country cousin in town. She went very often to the play, so often at times as to be weary of it. The hypocrite, Bickerstaff's alteration of Kibber's adaptation of Tartuffe, well entertained her, Doughton and Matthews being the chief actors, and she saw Liston, Miss Stevens, Miss O'Neill, and Keane at the outset of his fame. The clandestine marriage was a favourite piece, and on one occasion she notes that her nieces, whom she sometimes took to the theatre, revelled last night in Don Juan, whom we left in hell at half-past eleven. 
such joys however did not move her mind enough to seduce her from the country as a source of inspiration for her work all lives lived out of london are mistakes more or less grievous but mistakes said sydney smith adapting consciously or not the saying of mascarill to the precieuses pour moi je tiens que hors de paris il n'y a point de salut pour les honnêtes gens the life of jane austen whose humour the author of the plimley letters the father and uncle of a hundred diverting anecdotes so greatly enjoyed may serve to show the weakness of such unreserved generalization her subjects were found in the restful backwaters of life not in the crowded centres where mankind is more and more bewildered by the failure of wisdom to keep pace with the advance of knowledge it is one of jane's qualities as a writer that she shows little hospitality to the stock phrases of ordinary people lord chesterfield told his son if instead of saying that tastes are different and that every man has his own peculiar one you should let off a proverb and say that what is one man's meat is another man's poison everybody would be persuaded that you had never kept company with anybody above footmen and housemaids proverbial philosophy finds little encouragement from jane who places it in the mouths of her least agreeable characters and one may believe after reading her books and her letters that she agrees with her own marianne dashwood who when sir john middleton has dared to suggest that she will be setting her cap at willoughby warmly replies that is an expression sir john which i particularly dislike i abhor every commonplace phrase by which wit is intended and setting one's cap at a man or making a conquest are the most odious of all their tendency is gross and illiberal and if their construction could ever have been deemed clever time has long ago destroyed all its ingenuity the offending sir john did not much understand this reproof but he laughed as heartily as if he did elizabeth bennett's use of the saying keep your breath to cool your porridge gives us a worse shock than it can have given to darcy so unexpected is it from the mouth of a jane austen heroine when one of cassandra's letters had diverted jane beyond moderation and she added i could die of laughter at it she felt the banality of the phrase as keenly as marianne would have done and saved herself with as they used to say at school whatever the words and phrases she employed it can never be held that she spoke well according to the test proposed by catherine morland when she said to henry tilney I cannot speak well enough to be unintelligible a remark which mr tilney hailed with delight as an excellent satire on modern language its origin may be found in that first volume of the mirror which catherine's mother brought downstairs for her edification where we are told that many great personages contrived to be unintelligible in order to be respected a peculiarity of jane austen's vocabulary and manner is her fondness for negatives in un such words as unabsurd unpretty unrepulsable unfastidious untoward and unexceptionable a pet fancy of hers which occurs i am told at least eight times in emma alone being as common in her novels as halidome and minion in the older romances of water street some day perhaps a lost novel of hers written during the apparently idle years of her residence at bath will be identified by the prevalence of un in its text in clarity of meaning her style is usually of the purest and there is reason to think that her few obscurities are as often due to carelessness as to defective art not that she was exempt from all the weaknesses that she discovers for our amusement in the generality of her sex henry tilney's appreciation of women as letter writers can hardly have been imagined without at least a moment's reflection by the author over her own achievements i have sometimes thought says catherine doubtfully whether ladies do write so much better letters than gentlemen that is i should not think the superiority was always on our side as far as i have had the opportunity of judging replied tilney it seems to me that the usual style of letter writing among women is faultless except in three particulars and what are they a general deficiency of subject a total inattention to stops and a very frequent ignorance of grammar upon my word i need not have been afraid of disclaiming the compliment you do not think too highly of us in that way i should no more lay it down as a general rule that women write better letters than men than that they sing better duets or draw better landscapes in every power of which taste is the foundation excellence is pretty fairly divided between the sexes 
deficiency of subject has not been charged against jane's published letters but they have often been charged with deficiency of serious interest her works certainly do exhibit an occasional looseness of grammar mostly due to bad punctuation the faulty construction of lucy's letters sense and sensibility is noted by the author but while jane would not have been likely to regard sincerely wish you happy in your choice as a proper way of beginning a sentence her own delinquencies with respect to commas are sometimes no less grave than those of mrs robert ferrers she would have felt no serious sympathy with cyrano's declaration concerning his literary compositions monson se coagule en pensant qu'on y peut changer un virgule her blood was too cool to be frozen by the printer's fancies in punctuation in an old number of the cambridge observer the curious student may find some suggested emendations of jane austen's text by mr a w verrall many of them being concerned with what are probably printer's errors those which deal with punctuation need not reflect on the printer as prime offender the author was a woman mr verrall's ingenious suggestion that when jane austen is made to say that william price's direct holidays might justly be given to his friends at mansfield park his own family seeing him frequently at portsmouth where his ship was lying she really wrote derelict holidays has little to commend it direct so evidently i think being used to differentiate his actual leave from his ordinary leisure hours when on service but there are two emendations typical of many which might be suggested mr verrall has probably noted them for the edition which he ought to undertake in time for the centenary which are entirely acceptable fanny price is made to say to mr rushworth on the occasion when maria bertram and crawford gave that unfortunate person the slip in his own garden they desired me to stay my cousin maria charged me to say that you would find them at the knoll or thereabouts mr verrall justly observes that no one had desired fanny to stay and that she would be the last girl to utter an irrelevant falsehood he holds that she really did on this occasion for kindness sake say something not quite true and it was they desired me to say my cousin maria charged me to say that you would find them at that knoll or thereabouts again when in describing the discussion over mrs weston's proposed dance jane austen is made to say in emma the want of proper families in the place and the conviction that none beyond the place and its immediate environs could be attempted to attend were mentioned the author's words were in mr verrall's opinion tempted to attend like shakespeare's the manuscript of jane austen's masterpieces are to seek so that what she wrote we cannot prove the probability that in these two cases as in others the author omitted to notice in proof the errors of the printer is more likely on the whole than that her pen had slipped badly and that her copy had never been carefully read over she cared little for such slips however as we know from a letter written after pride and prejudice was published wherein she says there are a few typical errors and a said he or said she would sometimes make the dialogue more immediately clear but i do not write for such dull elves as have not a great deal of ingenuity themselves typical of course is here used in its obsolete sense of typographical the negative bond of union referred to above between jane austen and the only english writer whom some of her eminent admirers have allowed to take precedence of her that the manuscript of both have disappeared suggests the passing reflection that in these days when shakespeare is not allowed to hold the title to his plays without challenge when anne and emily bronte are accused of being so far as the public is concerned mere pseudonyms of their sister charlotte when george henry lewes has been given the credit for george eliot's novels and the speeches of eminent statesmen are said to be written by their wives it is rather surprising that no one in search of a striking subject for a magazine article has attacked the claims of jane austen to a place among english authors there is no evidence in the memoirs of her time that any distinguished person ever found himself in her company her name did not appear on the title pages of any books she was almost unknown outside a small provincial circle and in that circle no one seemed to have had any idea that there was anything specially remarkable about her is it likely that such an obscure little body should have written such admirable books is it not much more likely that they were the work of madame de Arble, or that in these peaceful compositions mrs radcliffe found rest and recreation after the fearful strain on her delicate nervous system involved in the production of her epouvantable melodramas 
Jane Austen lays claim to some of the novels in her letters, it is true, but since Ben Jonson's references to Shakespeare, and all other contemporary evidence in favour of the Stratford actor's authorship of the plays have been explained away, to the complete satisfaction of those who dispute his claims, it would be no very difficult task to persuade a number of earnest souls that Jane Austen's letters are not really evidence of her authorship of the novels. As for her nearest relations, they were not in the real secret. The secret they are supposed to have kept during her life was that she wrote the novels, but if so, where are the manuscripts? Why did not her admiring brothers treasure those most precious relics? Two of her manuscripts, in addition to the opening chapters of her final effort in fiction, her family did as a fact preserve, those of Lady Susan and the Watsons. And these, here italic type becomes necessary, are so inferior to the six novels acknowledged soon after her death as hers, that it is easy, if we like, to find it difficult to believe that they are from the same pen. The real secret was that she did not write those six novels. This fascinating theory is freely offered to whomsoever it may please to follow it up. We gain many vivid glimpses of Jane Austen's views of life in her novels, and Northanger Abbey holds a place apart from the others, not only for its many pages of burlesque, but as the vehicle by which so many of the author's reflections are conveyed, in a bright wrapping, to her appreciative readers. Let me give one or two examples. The advantages of natural folly in a beautiful girl have already been set forth by the capital pen of a sister author and to her treatment of the subject i will only add in justice to men that though to the larger and more trifling part of the sex imbecility in females is a great enhancement of their personal charms there is a portion of them too reasonable and too well informed themselves to desire anything more in woman than ignorance but catherine did not know her own advantages did not know that a good-looking girl with an affectionate heart and a very ignorant mind cannot fail of attracting a clever young man unless circumstances are particularly untoward the sister author is fanny burney the opinion of men the trifling or the reasonable is jane austen's in henry tilney's remarks upon catherine's extraordinary fears concerning his father's conduct to mrs tilney we may discover something of jane's view of the general condition of society in her time dear miss morland consider the dreadful nature of the suspicions you have entertained what have you been judging from remember the country and the age in which we live remember that we are english that we are christians consult your own understanding your own sense of the probable your own observation of what is passing around you does our education prepare us for such atrocities do our laws connive at them could they be perpetrated without being known in a country like this where society and literary intercourse is on such a footing where every man is surrounded by a neighbourhood of voluntary spies and where roads and newspapers lay everything open dear miss morland what ideas have you been admitting of jane austen as a humorist there is no need to write specifically at any length almost every extract given from her novels whatever the point to be illustrated shows her in that capacity it is impossible for long to separate her humour from the rest of her qualities yet there are people who see no humour in her and actually like her novels in spite of their seriousness an american author mr oscar adams wrote a book about her some years ago in order to place her before the world as the winsome delightful woman that she really was and thus to dispel the unattractive not to say forbidding mental picture that so many have formed of her who were these many people Evidently they existed, either without or within the author's own circle, or there would have been no reason to write a book for their conversion. They were probably those worthy persons, we have all met a few of them ourselves, who read Emma and Pride and Prejudice and the rest, without noticing that a malicious little sprite is forever peeping between the lines. Imagine a reader who regards all Mr. Bennett's remarks as sober statements of considered opinion, and you will understand how Jane Austen might seem formidable though she is never so ruthless to her characters as mr bennett is to his wife jane is herself a member of his family perhaps ruthless is the wrong word you might apply it to a boy who throws pebbles at a donkey but if the object of his attack was a rhinoceros the boy would suffer more than the pachyderm to the slings and arrows of her husband's outrageous humour mrs bennett was less sensible than was gulliver to the darts of the lilliputians gulliver did feel a pricking sensation whereas mrs bennet was merely annoyed that mr bennet did not always agree with her mood of the moment 
in his critical introduction to pride and prejudice professor saintsbury forcibly says in reply to those who resent the presence of such a husband as mr bennett that mrs bennett was a quite irreclaimable fool and unless he had shot her or himself there was no way out of it for a man of sense and spirit but the ironic the most unpleasant aspect of Mr. Bennet's sarcasms is not that they hurt his wife, which they could not, but that they were heard by his five daughters, three of whom at least were more or less able to understand them. Jane Austen the novelist, then, may be truly forbidding to readers who take her, au pied de la lettre. Such readers are in the position of Catherine Morland, listening to Henry Tilney's imaginary account of the antiquities and mysteries of Northanger Abbey. She went there and painfully discovered the truth while they can no more hope to discover it than a man with one eye can hope to see things as they appear to his fellows who have two. Still, he is a king among the blind, and the readers who find pleasure in Jane Austen as an entirely serious author are to be counted happy as compared with those who cannot read her at all. It has been said by Mr. Goldwyn Smith that there is no philosophy beneath the surface of Jane Austen's novels for profound scrutiny to bring to light, her characters typifying nothing because their doings and sayings are familiar and commonplace her genius is shown in making the familiar and commonplace intensely interesting and amusing such justification as may be discovered for the charge that the subjects of the novels are commonplace is chiefly negative in kind it is not that we may find in real life innumerable people as distinctive and entertaining as the principal characters of these stories but that jane does not introduce us to dramatically unusual scenes or persons there are no houses like Dotheboys Hall or Ravenswood Tower, no incidents like the flight of Joss Sedley from Brussels or the arrest of Vautrin, no strange creatures like Mr. Rochester or Jonas Chuzzlewit, no scenes like those in Fagin's Kitchen or Shirley's Mill. She was immediately followed by a humorist whose scenes and characters are as unusual as hers were familiar. He is almost unknown to the great fiction-devouring public, and little read in comparison even with Jane Austen, with whom he has some strong affinities as well as antipathies. Thomas Love Peacock was never so happily inspired, or so happy perhaps, as when he was ironing the insincerity or the unreasonable prejudice of the well-to-do class. There is, among the parsons of Jane Austen's creating, none who is more gloriously diverting than Dr. Folliot in Crotchet Castle and it is pleasant to imagine Mr. Collins as curate to that militant theologian. The talk of the young women in Peacock's modern novels is better informed and much less natural than that of Elizabeth Bennet or Emma or Anne. And as for the men, while Mr. Tilney or Mr. Darcy may not have found it difficult to hold their own with most of the lovers in Peacock's novels, his intellectuals, Milestone, McQueedy and the rest, would have found no one to refute their arguments among the company at Netherfield or at Mansfield Park. Peacock allows his satirical hobby-horse to run wild over the bramble-covered desert of British prejudice, while Jane Austen never leaves go of the rain. The result is that while he frequently makes us laugh at the absurdities of his skithrops and chainmails, whose performances we know to be burlesque, she makes us chuckle by her silver-shod satire of the class which she had studied from childhood. There are some who read Jane Austen and cannot read Peacock, and the reverse is also true. Those who can read both are never likely to be in want of pleasure on winter evenings so long as mind and eyes are left. It is certain that no one familiar with either author could mistake a page written by one of them for a page by the other. Jane Austen's people, in spite of the humour with which the atmosphere is charged, are always possible, except some of her most intimate admirers, say, for Mr. Collins while Peacock was never to be deterred from breaking through the fence which borders the pathway of probability. Only such readers as the prelate who declined to believe some of the incidents in Gulliver's travels could be expected to regard Melancourt or Nightmare Abbey as veracious narratives. For all that, Peacock, whose first novel, Headlong Hall, appeared in the year 1816, in which Jane Austen's last published work was done, was her immediate successor as a satirist of the follies and foibles of English men and women, and he was succeeded in turn by the splendid Thackeray, whose most obvious difference from Jane Austen lies in his frequent indulgence in sentimental reflections. Jane was amused by the suggestions for improving her work, or for the plots of fresh novels given to her from time to time, and among the papers found after her death was one endorsed, Plan of a novel, according to hints from various quarters, 
the names of some of these human quarters being given in the margin. There were to be a faultless heroine and her faultless father, driven from place to place over Europe by the vile arts of a totally unprincipled and heartless young man, desperately in love with the heroine and pursuing her with unrelenting passion. Wherever she went, somebody fell in love with her, and she received frequent offers of marriage, which she referred to her father, who was exceedingly angry that he should not be the first applied to. The anti-hero again and again carried her off, and she was now and then starved to death, but was always rescued, either by her father or the hero. For even the mildest varieties of the plots thus burlesqued, Jane had no use unless to laugh at them. End of chapter 2